welcome to our GRG online meeting. Today is Saturday, February 26th, 2022. We had a bit of a misstep with the links. The original link did not work. So I sent out a new one and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, ten of us all together. So that's um, probably about the usual um, number of people who join. Actually, we usually have uh, 12, 14, sometimes 18 or so, but uh, hopefully everyone has found their way here to the correct link. I'm going to first share my screen and take a look at our agenda. So, uh, much thanks to Miles Jacobs and um, I, I don't know what happened to Miles today, but he is the guy who sets up these meetings and manages them and coordinates everything and sets the agenda. So this is the agenda that he had uh, originally set up. And we were, just before beginning the, the, the recording, talking about item one. And um, Akshay was... Uh, same, Akshay knows a good deal about this and it looks very exciting. So I will now, oops, admit, admit John Kramer. Hello, John. Um, the meeting is being recorded and I'll now shift over to the paper. And um, uh, Akshay, thank you for allowing the interruption. If you'd maybe in one or two sentence briefly recap what you've said and uh, please proceed you you know a lot about this that's great yes i was saying that uh, this paper by professor samuel beck and his team is one of my favorites this year uh, it's it's showing it's throwing light on a part of uh, cellular changes that we have not been follow researching so much like we have seen a lot of research on methylation and the silencing of genes that are beneficial to us but uh, what Samuel Beck has I also discovered did. is uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a part of uh, I mean the genes where uh, you know, CPG islands are lacking and there is activation of genes which are supposed to remain silent. So, you know, in our cell, most of the genes would be permanently silenced to create a cell identity. And uh, as we age, uh, apparently many of those genes which are supposed to remain silent are being activated and uh, that would at some point lead in loss of cellular identity and uh, you know uh, disease so uh, this was a very interesting finding and then based on these findings one could look at uh, you know tar targeted therapeutics that could try to remedy that outstanding Let's scroll down a little bit. And scroll down to the end and see what conclusions they may have. Maybe we could um, just read the abstract. Okay. 
Okay, expression is young. This is the RG in this expression. Okay. Very good. Um, does anyone have any more comments or questions about this paper before we move on to the next? Okay, guess not. Let's look again at the second, aging caused by methylation of um, euchromatin starting after puberty and possible reversal with Jumanji D3. Okay, so let's go to that. Uh, one. Hey, Johnny. Yeah. Actually, I thought I was interested in the paper earlier. I didn't realize my uh, sound was turned off. Oh, okay. So we'll go back to it. I want to take a look a little bit. Okay, go ahead. So uh, one of the things here is I think this is, uh, you know, these type of papers are important. But, uh, you know, I think one of the risks here is when it starts off with aging is characterized by, um, you know, I think that there are many, uh, there are many aspects of the aging process. And, and I think that too many of the experts in the field are focusing on their one area of aging. And, and try to make it sound like this is the, the, you know, the secret or the cause. And I think that we need a larger view, um, you know, that aging is not just, you know, antioxidants and it's not just, you know, telomere shortening and it's not just this or that. And, um, you know, I think this is one of the things why the GRG is important because it helps to bring together people with the various viewpoints and, you know, we may not always uh, agree on this, but science, you know, part of science is just uh, to, you know, have a discussion that's based on, on rationality and uh, basically testing a, testing of evidence. So, um, you know, I think, though, at the at the moment, though, you can at least say that from from the detail standpoint, this is, uh, you know, very uh, interesting uh, uh, paper from the from the details standpoint. Yeah, but, you know, before you came in, uh, Akshay pointed out. Uh, some research uh, that's kind of exciting that uh, uh, researches why animals are so long lived and the mechanisms um, that uh, have been uncovered between naked mole rats and whales are, are different mechanisms. And I've long yes. held that, uh, um, you know, we're all different and certainly multi multifaceted and aging is caused by multiple causes and effects. And for any individual, we possibly have our own weak link. And one important uh, program for a, um, a personal age management program or to quote uh, Kevin Parrott, uh, self-directed age management program is finding your own weak link and treating it. And yes. um, I noticed Kevin has joined us. Um, hopefully the uh, initial uh, Zoom link didn't throw you too much of a curveball. And I noticed that uh, also Vincenzo is here. Uh, I noticed that Miles had had you down as the number three speaker, but I, I'm just going to suggest that um, uh, since your time is uh, very, very in short supply, that you may want to give your talk now or say whatever it is you had to say. And I'm, I'm all for creating a real time machine with me. I want more time. Um, so if you can show us how to do that, uh, do, you, do you want to go next or do you want to wait until uh, we've, uh, I, if you want, I mean, we can, we basically my, uh, everything that I would have to say and, uh, and I'm going to let uh, Vincenzo sort of maybe walk through some of the latest things first for the, uh, how we can help ourselves, uh, the, the platform kind of thing. And similar to every, we've been talking, you and I for golly, God, 10 years at least, um, yeah, about some of the same things we're going to talk about right today, and they still are the main issue. Um, for me, the science is there to be discovered. 
you know, it, it's not, we're, we're not faced the most with the most technical problems to find out why bodies age. We have tools, we have lots of things that we can actually use. The main problem is working together uh, and pulling in the same direction. And as uh, somebody was saying here just a few minutes ago, um, every book we can, we can argue about what is the, uh, you know, the, the real thing and uh, everybody's interest has their particular passions or particular take on aging. But at the end of the day, we're all dying of it. And uh, it's all in our best interest to work together as much as possible to bring forward the day when we actually have interventions because all of the arguing in the world doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so I've been doing this for 20 years at least, and uh, you know I'm getting a little tired of waiting for people to wake up and work together. Uh, there's still a lot of people all just uh, push, pulling apart. So how do we create a time machine, a mechanism by which we can transfer the energy and the suffering of individuals into the products and services that they need to uh, maintain or restore their health? And for that purpose, it's uh, if we rely on normal corporate interests, um, or I should say the interests of healthy people, the currently healthy, instead of the patients in waiting, uh, which they are, everybody comes at a lot of these solutions from the position that they are currently healthy. They don't have the same sense of urgency of the people who are actually suffering uh, today, and they forget that they will be suffering from these things tomorrow. So it's, it's really behooves us all to, I'm a cancer survivor, if you, you know, so I'm, I'm always speaking from the position of somebody who has a terminal and knows what it's like to have a terminal illness uh, and a terminal diagnosis. Um, there's no illusion for me that I have a tomorrow or that I have a next week. This is like, uh, uh, this is not a test drive. Um, so if we can, um, I'm gonna let, so, so we decided to speed up the whole intervention development cycle. It's not just simply one intervention or one idea, uh, like rapamycin in 2008 was, you know, suggested that it might be helpful for humans and human aging, and yet it still has not been properly tested in, in a pharmaceutical trial. Uh, Ageless RX is a company that's doing that. Um, but years and years and years can go by without basic uh, interventions which are already on the table being properly tested and then using the results from those tests to inform better, the next better intervention. So we need to create a, a, a system that can test millions of hypotheses in parallel and uh, propose interventions and have those, event, those ideas tested. And the best, my goal would be to create an in silico version of human health that could be, you could actually test human interventions without actually having to test in live humans because humans are terrible for varium subjects. Uh, they don't listen. Um, so how do we, how do we create a, a systems biology driven version of human health? And you have to do that with data. And right now there is not enough data. Uh, and so that's why uh, I created Open Cures was to help individuals measuring their own health, pool their data in a scientifically accurate way so that we can fill in the gaps and backfill in uh, some of the missing pieces that the NIH has left and that public health has left. And that most scientists don't even talk the same language. They don't talk the same units. The United States still uses the imperial system. You know, it's just absolutely insane. And we expect to have science pr producing interventions in aging when we can't even agree on what units to actually use. Um, it's kind of a laugh, actually. This whole effort is a, bit of a, is a bit of a laugh because we are grasping and time is going and we are still diddling around. Uh, so we really need to come together as a, as a community, as a group, um, and try to pool our resources, both intellectual, financial, and all of that, to, to, to build the system. So with that, I'll just let Vincenzo maybe talk about the latest version of our uh, system, which uh, is coming along nicely, to capture that data that we're all generating in our own lives. And how do we 
then focus the value of that data that we're capturing on the research problems that we collectively think are important. Is that okay, John? Is that, a that, that would be great. That was an outstanding introduction. And in case anyone missed uh, or came in late, our session is being recorded. It'll go up on our YouTube channel. So um, we'll have an open discussion later with the recording off. Vincenzo, please continue. Hi there, uh, hi together. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, thanks, Kevin, for the introduction. Um, thanks for having me, Johnny. Um, since I'm on the phone, uh, I would rely on, on Kevin, I'm sorry, uh, to show something, uh, which uh, leads my uh, news from my side. Um, when talking about news from our side, we, um, since the last talk we had with you, Johnny, uh, about when you showed your system, um, we, we thought a lot about um, interoperability and, and data standards and, and basic health data handling technology. And this is why we um, thought we, we spin out like an open source project for um, creating this kind of um, health data infrastructure uh, to support, I mean, there is a lot of um, health data businesses, a lot of health data applications and uh, the user and the users are like, uh, not just the, the patients, but also physicians, et cetera, um, they have the problem of the portability of that data. So we thought, okay, let's, let's create an open source project. Johnny, if I, can, if I can share my screen, uh, that would be helpful. Yeah, let me... Um... And I don't have the latest uh, uh, version loaded, uh, Vincenzo, so there's some, like, there may be things missing. Are, are you now able to share, Kevin, or do I need to try? Yep, yeah, no, I can do that now. Okay. Yeah. Then, oh, and I did uh, notice you're active with the Cure Cure Dial. Cure yeah. Um, yes. We, we could actually. I, I yeah. that as well. So. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so. Perfect. Okay. So uh, you go ahead, uh, Vincenzo. Just tell me where to click. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I probably yeah. don't have much data in my my uh, profile to show anyone, but we can actually talk about the features, and we can also talk about. I think maybe Cure Down might be a better. Uh, a better thing to talk about right now. Um, yeah, so. so what we did there, um, you can go to, um, yeah, so this is our, um, the, the a, a simple website we, we put up um, so far, like, I mean, we started um, in January this year. Uh, so it's a really uh, new project. Um, we thought um, on the open source side, we would take a step back and look into um, what, what software is actually there. And because, to create this um, this um, time machine, what Kevin was talking about, to, to create an in silico model, what we need is data. How we get there more efficiently uh, when we collaborate, when we have a basic technology, like a common language for all these health data businesses uh, to actually create data, share data, and um, be able to handle that data in, in aggregation. And this is why we created CureDAO. Um, and in a nutshell, what it should do is um, that it can aggregate and ingest uh, and normalize data from um, all sources, not just EHR and wearables, um, like some services are available already today, but uh, even more health data, which is not even clearly visible as health, health data, and, to, and also to create um, the gaps in, in health data standards. So FHIR and LOINC, um, maybe that's um, familiar for you, uh, is not solving all of that problems. And to aggregate all of that health data, uh, to present like a storage, a storage solution for health data in, um, and, and in an open source format, which um, everybody can spin up an instance of easily, and then an API where you can query data sets for data analysis. So mainly for the purpose of data analysis. And all of that in an open source infrastructure, which is open source and anybody can run an instance for himself to have the data privacy. But all of that is handled in, in a data format, which is then shareable and uh, can create interoperability. So that's the, the main that's point the main in a nutshell thing. for yeah. Yeah. Pure down. And it's 
it's a massive undertaking uh, and it's community oriented. There's no remote, you know, uh, idea that we are going to, that Open Cures or Cure Dow, you know, are, is going to be the, you know, the slam, the grand slam at all. Uh, what we need to do is create a community and provide the infrastructure and some of the uh, logic that allows individuals who are working on these things in some aspect of aging. Seas has been winning for the past few hundred thousand years. And it would be nice if we would all just come together and pull in the same direction. And that is really the key because this is not going to happen in my lifetime or in my parents' lifetime. Um, and I don't think that uh, cryonics is the answer. <laughs> I just don't. Uh -huh. I would prefer not to have to go down that road. Um, although for sure, I, I believe that it's, it's a viable uh, final house on the block kind of aspect. So we needed to create an open, we can't, it can't be proprietary. This is basic, um, basic technologies for, for data sharing, for data collection. You know, all of this stuff is just the basic logic that any company, startup or academic institution, some of this is, are, is basic functionality. And yet there is no standard platform for managing biomedical data or sharing it, especially, or pooling it, or focusing the value of it. And every time somebody has a company, they have to rebuild or, or not all of this infrastructure. It's like having to develop your own, you know, basic calculator that does plus, minus, divide, and subtract for even for any question that you may need to ask from a biological standpoint. If we're going to build a systems biology driven model of human biochemistry and health in, in silico that we can then use to test multiple or millions of hypotheses in parallel, we're gonna to need to have this basic in infrastructure in place. And there's just, we just can't, it's just not gonna be done in the shortest period of time. It's not that it can't be done, it's just the, before the heat death of the universe or you know within the lifetimes of people today. Um, so, I guess this is the time machine. This is the, and it's the beginning of the, we need to create a system that's focused on prevention, which helps people measure their health, which captures the data from the results of that, which allows then the individuals interested in interventions uh, to focus the value of their data on those interventions. Because as long as we stand aside and let other interests manage our data, manage, our value that we're creating individually, we are not going to get performance out of the system that we thought. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm well, done. Kevin Vincenzo, our um, new about to be released age management telehealth physicians will certainly be gathering some data and we intend to have it interoperable with this system. Could you tell me just a little bit more uh, it looks like from the diagram here that there is a data import from our age management, AMTP, I'll call it, system. Could you tell me, just describe what that format would be or and show me a, a file so that I can start thinking about how I can create the output interface and would it be I'll, like I'll, I'll just, I'll, 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 web service, something like that. Yeah. I'll let Vincenzo talk about it a bit, but it's it's really a GitHub effort. So people who are pro programming uh, effective, they know how to use GitHub, know how to collaborate from a programming perspective. Uh, that is sort of the environment that we're working with. It's open for anybody to join. We have a Discord server that people can join. Um, we have a lot of energy from new, young, incoming <laughs> brains, thank God. Uh, you know, who are working on different aspects of it and are passionate and are taking the lead uh, in uh, developing multiple aspects of this because this is way beyond the efforts of, of any single individual. Um, so I'll let Vincenzo, maybe if you're able to, can you talk about the Discord server and some of those other aspects of how people can get involved? I think he's off. There he is. Yeah, there he is. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry for it. Um, it's, um, it's very simple. Um, it is organized in a decentralized um, 
uh, organization that means um, everybody can come in and, and vote and and contribute so it's really um, open to um, how you can um, access or uh, collaborate or use that um, software infrastructure so the easiest way would be that um, I walk you through our API, which we have. Um, a second, give me a second. Sorry for that. Um, so that you actually, what what you would have to do is that um, this da uh, data format which we have created for our storage solution. Um, that you create um, a, a data mapping function in the end. And, and that would give you um, the interoperability with that software system. So this is actually what we do with all these um, plugins for um, that um, data format, which we have created there, um, that it transforms and, and normalize the data into that. Um, a simple mapping um, function is not the problem. Um, but the, the, the real the, the, the value, the functionality of the software framework is um, that the data will be um, validated against the references um, available um, with that software. Actual. Yeah, I think. A question? Okay. No. Go ahead. But, no, I think. Well, I, would I provide I think, a yeah. file in? in the format as, as dictated by the map that you would then import is, it, is that simple i mean simple what we're yeah you could that that's one way of talk, of having the data interface with the system as just having api calls and so that are, the data you would have an api that would have markers you would have a, it wouldn't be necessarily a file it could be a query generated data set that gets produced with a URL call. Um, but almost you know, just as importantly is that all the routines that we are developing for analysis, and these, these are going to be sort of standard routines that anybody would be able to utilize in their own, uh, in their own plugins. So your age mapping, uh, the age management uh, platform would be able to live like a layer on top of this infrastructure. Um, we were building open cures uh, with the different experiments that we're de dealing with and we realized that we were just building this infrastructure again and again and again and again. And it's just insane. So that's why we decided, okay, we're going to have to, we're going to create this infrastructure, but we're going to make it open source so that everybody can contribute to it because we need the help. And it's all, we're also going to make it available. So uh, there isn't exactly a specification no. sheet yet, that I'm, but it's being built. Actually, there is, and you can um, go to docs.cure.org mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there is a documentation for that. Is it under the white paper? Uh, yes. Okay, so it's still so very fresh, very new, a lot of documentation um, in the works. Yeah, um, very but, new. <laughs> uh, this is where it's, where it's going. Ah, here we go. Yeah, so yeah. we've got so, API, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, so yeah, imagine... I'm looking, um, we, looking forward to implementing that. I have some sample data now, so there's no need to wait for... Uh, for a lot of live patient data. So great. So we, we could talk techie uh, <laughs> offline sometime, but uh, yeah. There's, a, one, there's one person missing from this conversation today. His name is Mike Sin. And he has worked uh, many, many years on an awful lot of the, the features that you see here are being used whole cloth from his effort over the past years, and he is pooling all of his brain in, into this, just as we all are. So it's, it's really amazing what happens when people unreservedly share their passion, their productivity, and pool it together. That is what is going to solve the aging problem. Well, exactly, uh, and he, I'm sorry. Oh, and on Wednesday I'm, at one, uh, Brian Delaney and I have 
a meeting set up with Mike. Would it be useful to bring uh, either of you in on that, or should we just get to know him initially? It's. I think. A, I think just getting to know him as an individual is is a great uh, great way of being introduced to the complexity of his brain. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay, Vincenzo, um, you had something, I believe. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, close my presentation with them. Um, we met Mike and he had uh, developed a, a lot of applications in, in that direction already. And um, when I started to uh, implement the Open Curious solutions, um, we realized that we have so much overlap and I'm recreating so many things that uh, this is how it has to go. A, a collaborative, an open source collaborative um, where we uh, actually collaborate with a lot of more health data businesses and applications. Uh, to create this basic layer, like um, I would say, um, like WordPress did for web designers. That's the goal, it's, it's because the data is what drives everything. It's everything else is just a formatting and presentation and analysis of the value of the data. And there's going to be thousands of different things that a person can do with the with the data. Um, and open cures and uh, what we're doing with in terms of helping self-directed researchers, that's just one application of, of the data. It uses the same data, uses the same ways of accessing it, et cetera. So it, this is, so let's quit recreating the wheel. Let's all get together and sort of build this foundational uh, platform that anybody can then leverage to create and follow their own ideas, their own passions, but at least it enables everybody to speak mm -hmm. a common language and have the same tools. Did you try? And go ahead. Just a quick sidebar, I noticed a bottle of plasmalogen and I'm one of your big fans in my informal, and I, I repeat informal, uh, self-directed age management evaluations. I tried it and got some object, positive uh, objective as well as subjective results. So I'm, I'm one of your big fans there. Uh, Robert Young, who is our GRG Director of Supercentenarian Research and Database, asked uh, in the chat about um, <coughs> analyzing supercentenarian data. And we don't, um, my knowledge, have a lot of biological data, but there's a certain amount of demographic and others. Would you guys want to talk about that? Since that's Absolutely. That Robert really has a, no. has a handle on. Robert, thank you for, the, for bringing that up. I think that uh, anybody contributing, I mean, that's super valuable information. Um, and it's not just biomarker data, of course, we're interested in, we're interested in all types of data that can describe you know, whatever state a, a human biological system is in, and that includes behavioral and all that sort of uh, functional data. And I think it doesn't, you know, it's the bigger, the better, the more people, you know, the more people, the more contributors. And it's more of an awareness that this is happening to it that allows people to kind of hopefully gather around. It's, it's a, I, I feel like it's sort of like a stone soup kind of approach where everybody has, has a chunk. Somebody has meat, somebody else has a potato, somebody else, you know, we don't know exactly sometimes what value our data uh, has in the context of everybody else's data until we actually put it in there. So I am, you know, let's, I'm great guns for, for getting as many collaborators and people to work on this problem as possible. It needs to be structured and organized and scientifically rigorous. And I, that's why I think, uh, but it also has to be driven by passion. And um, I think that this would be a great opportunity to integrate uh, or talk to you about integrating whatever data you may have uh, with, with, the, with this platform in an open source way and get your other ideas because there's a lot of people on this call who've been doing this as almost as long or longer than I have. And there's a tremendous amount of wisdom uh, to access from there too. So we value everyone's input. It's open source for a reason. Um, you know, we're, we're interested in extracting value in creating time as the real wealth. Uh, you know, health is the real wealth. 
I, uh, I, have a, I have a kind of comment, and I basically think this is a really, really good idea. And uh, so I give you a, a, a thousand thumbs up on, on, the, on the concept. I think it's far more than uh, the, uh, just the WordPress sort of a thing. That's, that's an output. That's an output layer. This is, this is exactly the right thing that needs to be, do, be, be done. And the, uh, I love the fact that it's open source. I love the fact that you're using GitHub for it. And, and I saw, I read something there, when one of the flashing screens that went by. By the way, it'd be useful to, for, the, for the screen controller to, to show, you, you showed some screens for a long period of time. And I've, I've studied one screen a lot, but the other ones have flashed by. It'd be useful <clears> to have them up there. So in our, in our dead time, we could, we, we could continue to study those uh, uh, screens while we're waiting for people to, to, to get to the point or finish a point. Uh, the, uh, uh, there was something about a voting mechanism in there because of the of the of the GitHub thing <clears throat> that the project has a voting uh, mechanism to decide uh, which way to go, maybe fork the project or not fork fork the project. Would you elaborate a little bit about the voting mechanism? Because uh, I, I I just woke up. I'm on the West Coast, and I totally uh, I totally I totally get it. Uh, to be perfectly honest, the whole cure DAO kind of aspects that are not my forte. And I think Vincenzo can certainly talk about it more. And Mike, if he and Mike certainly would be able to as well. But maybe Vincenzo, you, you can touch on that because that is a, an important obviously it's an important aspect of what we're trying to do. Yeah, so um, I'm very excited about that. Um, thanks for that question. This is really um, what makes it special um, compared to a, um, a normal uh, open source project because it's not centrally organized, it's decentrally organized. And by any contributor who uh, comes in and contributes, um, he can actually also vote uh, in uh, business decisions and where to go or which features should be in the core or um, these kind of directions. So it's totally open for that. It's based, are, are, we, are, are, we, are we working basically like by the DAOs uh, voting mechanism? Yes, so it's Web3 um, powered um, and um, like it's like mm -hmm. uh, it's um, it, there is a crypto token behind which um, someone can purchase and that is also um, the, the voting mechanism you can use so um, with, with the token you have at hand you are allowed to, to vote for these decisions and there are uh, proposals um, published we're, um, to to see all the decisions which are proposed and where and where you can vote. So this is the, the special new kind of uh, mechanisms which are right now developed and called decentralized autonomous organizations. Yeah, we're we're following Vita Dow's uh, method right now, but there is a, obviously a bunch of different ways that uh, people can be either incentivized or rewarded. Um, and uh, I am certainly not wedded to a particular uh, way. I'm agnostic. Uh, for me, it's about minimizing time to the development of interventions and whatever mechanism thereof to do that is, is uh, we're going with, with something which is, has been proven to be somewhat successful. I'm pretty sure that there's going to be a bunch of different uh, reasons why we would want to try different variations on a theme or completely different ways of doing it. Um, and again, it's going to be a community effort. Uh, we can start things, uh, but it's going to take everybody, you know, pulling in the same direction with their ideas. Uh, and it's going to be an iterative self-adjusting uh, system so that as we go forward, if we're not making that much progress with one particular uh, method that will show up, and we will have to, we will pivot or we will change uh, our trajectories in order to, to deal with whatever it is that's slowing us down. So we need, we need to really just uh, uh, find the best mechanism for transducing the energy within the suffering of individuals into the development of their own cures. And this is the tokenization uh, strategy done with Vita Dao is, is probably the best. Uh, 
example of, of that right at the moment. I, I have another question. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, I'll have to read about the, uh, the open DAO uh, mechanism, uh, but I guess my, my, my thought is, is that um, in the world, there's more than one organism. Uh, there's people and there's lions and tigers and uh, sheep and bacteria and, you know, things. Yep. And so the open dial might be the mechanism for evolving a single organism. But, it, but in order to explore the opportunity space, uh, mm. the, the consider you, you, you take you take some of uh, Francis Crick's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, DNA dust that uh, drifts through space and hits a virgin planet and seeds it and uh, and from the, from that uh, you know the whole planet uh, evolves life uh, that's suitable for that planet's Fair ecosystem enough. as it is right now. Uh, so in order to evolve the entire ecosystem, the entire life set of life forms on a brand new planet, uh, you're going to have to you can't you can't just have open dial choosing the best organism right now because that's one organism yeah, then, let, let me just i'm sorry to yeah i totally agree there is absolutely no way that we would suggest or even be so you know that this is the only or thing or it's even the right thing it's just a thing um and i would love to get feedback and i told i love what i love what you're saying about you know multiple organisms different species in different niches i actually think very much similarly that there's an environment into which life emerges and it's the context that kind of shapes the the logic of of the biological you know uh, features um and it's over time and so that's kind of exactly <laughs> how i think about this so thank you for for that and what do you think would be other mechanisms? Uh, you know, what would your mechanism be for well, for that? Well, uh, well, again, uh, this is early morning for me, and I'm uh, minimally caffeinated and inadequately <laughs> caffeinated. So, but but in general, what I think is that, uh, well, I'm ju I'm just going back to the thing here. Uh, isn't the central concept of systems biology the notion of networks of networks? Yep. Yep. And, and if that's the case, then uh, oh, and, and really uh, cyberspace is, I'm just going to assert, uh, cyberspace is, is, is of in, infinite size. It's just information. So uh, with computing and uh, you can buy a terabyte of disk now for, you know, a hundred bucks. And, and so uh, cyberspace is essentially free, almost free, and, and certainly infinite. And so the, the imagination is your, is your limit. And if, if you take the systems biology model, uh, you're going for infinity. And so notionally, then, you're going to want to set these systems up and not do just systems, not do just your project open cures for humans, but also fish and dogs and cats and everything else. And the, uh, the model needs to be generalized. And so ultimately then this, the open cures model for human beings and aging is just a subset of uh, the open, oh. the generalization mm -hmm. of the open mm -hmm. cures model for all life forms we know on earth uh, and and that also leaves the notion of I think it uh, captures that yeah. uh, mm -hmm. of, synthet of synthetic biology uh, because there's a whole notion of the, the synthetic life uh, uh, you know in, in, in the there's a whole a whole field of synthetic life so I think that's the way which, the way you go and which raises the and now this needs a lot of help and I see you've got about 50 or 73 people uh, signed up so far some small number less than a hundred and so you need to start uh, well we need to we need to start pulling people into the system and uh and getting it going and Absolutely. we really we really need societal funding for this because mm -hmm. this is for the good of all mankind uh not 100%. just not just a bunch of uh, old old guys uh, who are worried about running out of time 
Yeah, I'm definitely worried about running out of health more than I am about running out of time. I think yeah. that your point, your point, your point on the generalization uh, capacity of generalization of the platform is 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 actually uh, working in a lab with a bad lab book management situation that really brought to my attention that all data, all research that is currently being captured is really not organized properly in a central facility, despite you know public money being used to generate all this information that is not really usable by anybody. And so I do believe that we have a generalizable uh, system for myself. I'm about minimizing time to the development of therapies for my parents. Uh, my dad is 80, my mom is 77. Um, I don't know if we, I, I wanna start with human relevant uh, data and work our way down <laughs> where necessary. <laughs> Uh, and then not not start with the the worms, flies, and mice, and stuff, and work our way up. Um, well, I, because I, did, I, yeah, I, I agree with that, but I think those people should be invited to contribute as well. And I think you're. I think that's a great point, and not one that I think we've talked about too much. Uh, and I think we should definitely integrate that into into the conversation. Thank you for okay, that. Okay, every everyone, we're we're about. An hour and fifteen minutes into our meeting time. Oh my goodness! I yeah. Most of uh, the members are still here. I'm just going to suggest. Um, I mean, I really appreciate that you talked about Open DAO, and um, I'm looking forward to participating. I, I'm going to suggest, though, that that Kevin and Vincenzo take just a few minutes, maybe three three to five minutes, to talk about Open Cures if you want to. And then I, I see Miles has joined us, and he's the resident expert on uh, topics one or two that we had on our, on our agenda today. So hopefully he'll educate us a little bit about those. So would, would you like to tell us a little bit Kevin, more? Kevin, can I find your, your email or contact information open, to talk uh, excuse more? Excuse me, we can't, we can't both talk at the same time. Um, so I'll, be, I'll try to be brief, but I got to finish. So, uh, Kevin Vincenzo, do you uh, want to talk about Open Cures very briefly before we move on? And uh, John, I believe you had something important to say. Oh, just that it's, it's, it's Kevin. Is your information available? I think I, I when I wake when I wake up, I have more questions and, and comments. So I'd like to communicate with you. So just look look for your email or something. Something I I can be found if you could write to GRG. But uh, Kevin at yeah. Open Cures. Kevin at opencures.org is, is I'm reachable at for sure. Thank and, you. And since I think we've adjusted our uh, platform, I'm not even sure which of the million addresses I've got is. Okay. Well, for tip, but, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So right now the platform is really, uh, it's not completely open. We're really being careful who we, uh, who we actually allow in um so if anybody can actually send a request to join and then with that request you can i think where is it we will contact you anyway send the request and i'll have to get back in i'm very sorry i don't want to i don't want to spend too much time but uh talking about we can come back to it, and if the, if you don't want to show your screen for some of this, that's okay. Yeah, let 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 me let me, let me get logged in, and um, then we'll worry about how to <laughs> actually talk about it. So yeah. I'll do well, that. Let's do this. Um, let's go back, and Miles is here. Hopefully, he's still still with us. He had set the agenda that uh, we did uh, Akshay proved to be very knowledgeable in this first topic. But uh, Miles, do you have something uh, to say regarding this? And I can go back to 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 the paper. Um, and are you still with us, Miles? I hope so. Yeah, thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. There's two papers which uh, which uh, I think we need to really, uh, I've got no choice except to emphasize these two papers uh, very seriously. I think these are very two very serious issues for all the members here for the anti-aging research. 
Yeah. Um, I think I, I need to repeat just quickly. We said in the past that uh, aging gets reset to zero in the embryo on the seventh day. That has been the discovery that the epigenome is reset to zero on the seventh day after conception. The egg and the sperm are old at conception. They're as old as the mother and the father. And then the embryo gets reset to zero on the seventh day. Secondly, the, we've shown with the reprogramming that the uh, cells go back to almost de-differentiating. Uh, we, we don't do CMIC, the, the fourth factor, fourth Yamanaka factor, the cells go back almost to being completely, uh, uh, um, uh, to, to, to being stem cells or uh, uh, induced stem cells. But, and then uh, they re-differentiate. So, so, so reprogramming to make uh, cells and organisms younger is a de-differentiation process but it doesn't go back to zero. It stops just before zero, and then the cells reassume their identity. And now there's been an interesting discovery that the reason why they can do that is because it appears the enhancers are not, repro not reset, so they're able to still find themselves back to what they were. There's been a, a paper in the last two weeks, but I'll discuss that in the future sometime. These other two papers are also critical because it shows uh, and I think we can argue about this, and I'm, I'm very happy people do, but it shows that aging, there's two processes in aging which nobody's been paying attention to, and that is the breakdown of the packed genes, the genes that are packed away, the heterochromatin, and then also the shutting off of the genes that are active, the euchromatin. Uh, these two processes have been discovered, and one has to be, you have to be aware of these two processes because they are macro, they're happening in all the cells. And then the last point I'm going to make is that Unfortunately, the second, uh, 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 such, uh, the second uh, uh, process of the cells being shut off indicates definitely that there is some sort of a death program which starts at puberty. At puberty, we can clearly see the heat shock response gets switched off. The clearing of the methylation of the, of the active DNA gets shut off, which means that there is a slow decline in the number of active genes. And both these processes being shut off occurs at puberty. It seems that you are optimized at that point for reproduction and the maintenance of your body is neglected by biology. And it happens in all organisms from the fruit fly, the worm, right up to humans. So these are the two papers I've put on the, on the chat. I mean, before I put people so that they can read it before this meeting, but it's very critical that we have a look at these two processes and that you, when you plan your anti-aging interventions, you must understand that from puberty on, people are basically left to deteriorate by some sort of master program, which switches you off to maximize your reproduction. <laughs> so I don't know, Johnny, if I can share my screen. I'm not gonna go through the papers like yeah. normal because they've been available. Can you just make me a co-host or something? I will click. All right, multiple participants, you should have on the bottom of your Zoom, a green share screen thing. Okay. Can you Fair see? Enough. Can you see the first paper? Like I said, can you see the paper? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so please, people, at puberty, it says the repression of the heat shock response, which is a maintenance process in your body, it is a programmed event at the onset of reproduction. At the onset of reproduction, from the worm to the fruit fly to humans, the heat shock response is partially switched off, and the resources needed for heat shock are put into reproduction. Um, I, I'm, I'm just flashing the paper because I think it's too complex to do this waste your time to go through it in detail, but you really have to read this paper um, because it shows there's some sort of almost like a death program which starts at your puberty. And the second article I want to just flash quickly. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing the other one, then the, 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 the first, the, the second article. Um, just a second, let me just get my, my screen sorted out here. Um, let's see. <clears throat> I don't, you see, I'm looking for the second. I'm just going to. Should you just get me to give you a second when I flash the second screen? 
There we go. Right, the, the, the second program says that the genes that are on, the genes in the U-chromatin, the genes that are on in the U-chromatin, they get methylated as you age, so they get switched off. And again, there was a process, Jumanji D3 protein normally demethylates this uh, uh, un unwelcome methylation, but that process gets switched off again at puberty. So then you find that your the, the genes the wrong off in the wrong cell. The net result of this is that in a heart cell, you find that genes that are supposed to be active in a liver are being switched on in the heart, and genes that are supposed to be off in the heart, sorry, they're supposed to be, uh, yeah, they're supposed to be off in the heart are being switched on. So there's a, and this is what they call the secretory or, or senescence, senescence uh, associated secretory product. Uh, which is then the result of a sort of uh, a, 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 almost like a, a, a cocktail of, 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 of incorrect molecules in the wrong cells. So I'm just, I'm just emphasizing these two processes. They're fundamental to aging. I can't see you um, ignoring them in your research. You've got to solve these two problems. Um, there are some ideas, but, but, but I, I, you have to make, uh, pay attention to this. So that's my, my, my contribution, Johnny. As I said, I've listed the papers, please read them several times because they're fascinating, absolutely fascinating and very critical for us to understand what aging is. Thank you very much. Well, what, uh, Miles, would Senolytics help with this problem? Does this, uh, uh, actually, let me back into it, does this problem increase as we age? Yes, it does, Johnny. Um, Senolytics does help. But fundamentally, we have to find a way to get the genes switched on again when they are switched off, and then vice versa. Those genes that are being switched on when they, they should not be switched on. Um, in the case of the, the first process of genes starting to be switched on, it, it results, it's a result of the loss of what they call the HP1 protein, which keeps the genes locked up effectively. And as a result, <coughs> also another protein, Lehman A, in the nuclear, an envelope, so as a result, because the genes are no longer locked, they start to fray and become available for transcription and, and the wrong prote uh, proteins are now being produced. The same thing with the, uh, with the genes that are being switched off, it should be on. If you can put the Jumanji protein in there and somehow start it up again, then you'd be able to clear the methylation and, and switch the genes on again. So this is a process which you will have to do in your stem cells, in the stem cells themselves. And it's not a good idea, I think, to get rid of the stem cells. So we find some, before we apply synolytics to the stem cells, find some way to make sure that the genes that are supposed to be off are kept off and the genes that are supposed to be on are kept on. Thank you. Now, I, I would expect that this, or you tell me, that this might be variable. It might be different genes uh, for different people. Is that correct? Correct, correct, correct. Uh, All but right, the, the well, then, then we'd need a way to analyze which genes there are lacking the CPG islands, but we do have DNA methylation testing that, you know, most of us would just get, get the age, but there is uh, a file available, typically. I know Zymo Research, I'm sure uh, Clock Foundation would have a file available to tell you which genes are screwed up. Is that a true statement, do you think? Yes, I, I believe so. I believe it's, it's different for different individuals because the genes are susceptible to different types of, of methylation and, and, and fragmentation. Okay. Um, but I'm still saying that, unfortunately, it, it's, a, it's something that's marching on for everybody, although it, yeah, there will be differences individual to individual. Well, that's great. Well, so it looks like we've knocked maybe 20 years off our development time of personalized therapies to fix my gene, particular uh, genes, your, your particular CPG islands, I, I should say. Um, so then that leaves us with uh, roughly the, the same question of how to deliver, you know, gene therapy or other, otherwise stimulate genes to work. So, okay, fantastic. <laughs> I, I can say, uh, any, Johnny, any the... other uh, comments? I, I see Kevin had a comment, but 
Kevin, uh, are we done with this topic? Do you want to jump back to uh, Kevin's presentation? I have I some can... further uh, comments on the two papers. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Miles, the, uh, you are absolutely right. Both the papers are happen to be my favorites. Uh, they are very, very enlightening. Uh, on the first one that you showed us, you know, for, of Professor Morimoto, uh, where, uh, you know, just a few days in the worms, just a few days after puberty, uh, you know, the heat shock protein response was uh, dialed down. Basically, what it, where it is happening is in the ubiquitin proteasome system, which is the system where our pro protein production is there. And protein production uh, is an intense process which requires uh, chaperones to uh, ensure that it goes through smoothly. Heat shock proteins uh, are uh, one of those chaperones. And, uh, you know, what happens is that uh, the efficiency of those uh, chaperones coming on being triggered uh, uh, against the stress during protein production actually goes down by almost 70% as, as discovered by uh, Morimoto and Lambada, which is why we end up getting misfolded proteins uh, because uh, one of the jobs of the chaperones is to refold, for example, the misfolded proteins. And uh, which which uh, which accumulates over time, you know, as aggregates, and then causes various diseases, including neurodegenerative diseases. I want to uh, uh, just share one uh, snippet of what I discovered during my research: oleuropin, which we get from olive leaf extract, has been shown to upregulate those chaperones. So uh, each one can, uh, you know, uh, research on their own or I can share it, but uh, olive leaf extract, uh, it's a natural extract from olive leaves uh, and all European is the extract. And if one takes in, in fact, one should take in just after puberty, one should start taking that daily. Uh, you know, it, to some extent it will, uh, blunt this uh, damage that happens to our protein production. Very good. Next. Can I, can I uh, just a comment again, uh, 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 Johnny? Uh, for, for the fraying, for the fraying of the genes, for the heterochromatin, for the, the wrong genes being switched on, you are losing two proteins, HP1 and Lehman A. And it's been shown that if you force up the amount of HP1, this process gets retarded and the genes remain locked. So there's been oh, one, right. one, one, uh, 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 almost like cure that has been noticed and people are look, look to be pursuing this one. The other one is that for the for the for the methylation that's happening in the, at the in the wrong places, the protein Jumanji D3, people have been upregulating that and seeing some benefits. So um, looks like those two interventions are uh, realistic and uh, should be pursued. Very good. Well, if there are no more comments, um, you know. Kevin, Vincenzo, did you want to? Um, I can. Go a little I can. More? I think, well, wait, Robert Young has something to say. And then, then Kevin, if you want. Uh, Fair enough. I can do a brief, I can do a brief run through of, of the, uh, of the platform just so that everybody can have a quick peek yeah. at it. For sure, Robert, yeah. Well, okay, so I just here. wanted to say something really quickly here. Go ahead. Uh, that I, I think that uh, it was very interesting to hear you uh, linking uh, several issues that had been, you know, studied before, such as laminate problem or misfolded protein problem. 
uh, you know, uh, Dr. Dr. L. Stephen Coles is, uh, you know, one of the pioneers in, in studying the problems with amyloidosis, uh, basically uh, seeming to be as a major limiting factor, you know, for the human lifespan, at least though it only affects about half the population. And uh, some of the people have, uh, you know, this folded proteins and the other half doesn't. So I think one thing would be interesting to see is, is maybe perhaps this mechanism could explain that uh, perhaps some people's uh, gene expression is, is turned on and some people's gene expression uh, is turned off. I'm just wondering if you're uh, if you're going to be uh, able to study that. There may be a hetero heterogeneous uh, population where the the uh, the human population we see, for example, almost half the human population is susceptible to Alzheimer's, and the other half is not. I, th I think that would be very interesting to find out. Uh, you know how the uh, gene signaling turning on and off uh, affects different populations uh, differently, and how to fix that. Yes. Okay. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay, and uh, let's see, Kevin, were you gonna show your screen and, and get yep. into open peers again or? Yep, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically we've been changing things uh, rather frequently and uh, yeah, uh, Vincenzo is an incredibly prolific and productive programmer, uh, but uh, the change, it doesn't leave those of us to follow. <laughs> follow the, you get used to something, and then suddenly there's a whole bunch of new features that you have to think about. But uh -huh. uh, but it's it, but it's very very good. So basically, after you uh, sign in and you create a profile, you are presented with uh, a, a subset of there, there's an administrative dashboard for for organizations helping people manage. Basically, you have this dashboard. There's this biological age. These kinds of cards, which are uh, you can choose the default layout that you're interested in. Um, I, I don't know if anybody has actually been looking at the Whoop band or the various other devices that are available, but um, I'm actually participating in a clinical trial now through the Buck Institute. And one of the devices that they're actually uh, requiring us to wear is this Whoop band, which I have been wearing for about two weeks now. And it provides things like strain score, <clears throat> excuse me, and recovery score and other, other, other scores. Um, but it just kind of tells you that things are rapidly uh, coming together with these wearable devices and other, if we can measure, uh, match them up with other biomarker measurements from your blood, uh, then you can start to look at uh, patterns within them. So you can set this up yourself. There's your general profile, which of course is the same kind of things that you have to, you know, you, you generally track all the demographic types of information basic and then there's different settings you can belong to various groups you can create your own groups and you also have uh, a biobank of your samples so which you will control so um i've got i've taken my blood probably 15 times and each time there's extra so i've been biobanking and creating an archive of my own self over the past two years and every and everybody who actually gets their uh, blood analyzed uh, does an assay has that capability of putting a little of themselves on ice so that we can go back to do that. And um, so this this uh, unfortunately this uh, profile is pretty empty. I can't show you much more than that um, than the options that currently exist. But one of the things that I've just playing around with is uh, Vincenzo worked an awful lot on importing data. Because a lot of people have pre-existing PDF reports of various things, and this is what Johnny, when you when you and I first talked about this so many years ago, and you had developed an import PDF uh, importer. So that was one of the things that we uh, took to heart. And I'll just show you kind of right now. We can import PDF reports from LabCorp Life Extension only for blood analysis. But I'll just even though it's just from LabCorp and um, Life Extension. We can actually, uh, I can just go through and put, so this is the uh, prodrome scan <clears throat> report. This is my latest one. And even though it doesn't understand what phosphatidylethanolamines are or plasmalogens quite yet in the reference database, it has gone through the report and pulled out the things that it does 
it was able to find. So it gives you this preview of the PDF. Um, and then for instance, down here at the bottom where it says total iron is 70, it's, it's actually pulled that out of, the, uh, of this report. So it's not limited to LabCorp or whatever. It's if you have a PDF that has a name of something in it that does correspond to a LOINC code, uh, which is basically the industry code sort of standard, it will fill that in and you're able to uh, see your PDF report and you can even show the extracted text that um, was done. And then you can basically import it. And I haven't done this yet, so it may or may not work. Uh, oh, it needs a timestamp. And so we'll just pick today. And then, yeah, so there we've, we've got a lot. So this is a, a, a layer that's going to be, yeah, import successful. I don't know what that particularly means, but you go back to your data and you start to see these blood analysis of these PDF reports that we get populated. Um, and then once you actually have data, you can create charts. <clears throat> and these charts actually form sort of like the core component. Uh, so once you describe a chart, it basically, you can then pop, there's a title description, chart settings, um, you can put it in your dashboard, and here's where you pick the biomarkers that you want to actually measure. So if it was, there's activity, there's, there's a gazillion things, frankly, it's just overwhelming. Um, but probably the most important thing is that together, everybody can actually, uh, once you've measured your data or you've imported your data, let's say you wanna share your data with other people, well, you can create an experiment in, in, within which you and other individuals here, this one has actually two. So we're, we're really at the very, very beginning. Um, but for instance, the Pearl uh, Ageless Rx, who we are working with uh, for the rapamycin trial that they've actually uh, started finally uh, 13, 14 years later. Um, <laughs> so we're actually working on, uh, helping them recruit, measure, identify assays. So anybody who is interested in creating a group of individuals who are measuring their health in a similar fashion, um, you know, you can create a group on this, on, on the platform, and then you can join, you have the permission, and then there's, we still got to think about all the permissions and uh, everything is GDPR, HIPAA, all of this regulatory stuff, which is frankly uh, a lot of friction between people who are already interested in sharing data with each other. But um, this is why it's a limited availability, why you have to request access right now. It's not just any come one, come all. You know, we wanna vet and validate uh, whoever uses this platform to make sure that they're interested and capable of, of being disciplined enough to actually uh, work with it. Anyway, so the, as you can see, there's a ton of different things that we can do. Uh, the biomarkers that we track is at here, so you can actually see, you know, which are the biomarkers we track that are nutritional. Um, there's sleep, physical activity, all of these can be expanded. And these are all of the types of biomarkers that are available for you to track yourself. And they're increasing. And, um, you know, so it really is, we need to create a generic tool that can handle almost the high resolution uh, experiment to the, you know, strip down, all I'm doing is taking a supplement once a day kind of experiment. So it's, it's, a, it's a big job. I uh, look forward to getting people's feedback. Hopefully uh, as we go forward, uh, we'll get more uh, of you, you know, implementing your own ideas, your own passions, because without the content, just like any other website, without content, it's just a framework that nobody ever uses. This is meant to be used. And uh, it's a very difficult, uh, me, this is not for mainstream, obviously. We're not gonna make a million dollars on this, uh, but we could potentially create the first calculator, the very first calculator for biomedical data storage with just that basic functionality and uh, again, on that layer of CureDAO uh, and the open source functionality on this, on which this relies. So I'll uh, just leave it there. There's always lots more to say, but I appreciate that there's other people who have other things to say too. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you.
how do we get two of these great uh, presentations uh, in the same presentation? <laughs> uh, <laughs> how do great people? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, open cures and cure DAO. Okay. Well, okay. Um, we'll move on to the open discussion part, and a little later we'll uh, turn off the recording. But in, what else you want to talk about? Anybody? I have to. I actually have to step away. I got you. I got to start a late start, and I appreciate. I appreciate the opportunity, Johnny, to to talk. And thanks, Miles, for the uh, invitation. And uh, I always, I'm, I'm always thirsty for this kind of discussion on on uh, you know the mechanisms, the heat shock protein uh, response. That was something that blew me away. Frankly, that this was sort of something that was set up so early. Uh, reminded me of the involution of the thymus almost, you know, it's just like there's these events which occur, which seem to be designed to ensure the deterioration of the organism. And I'm not really, really thrilled with that. One thing that I've always thought about is, um, well, when my eyes started to go, um, you know, my, and I couldn't see fine print anymore. And I was stuck in San Francisco with a flat tire in the middle of the night, and I'm trying to read the instructions from the owner's manual on how to get the fucking jack out from underneath my truck because it was one of those origami kind of things that you have to fold and jam and insert and oh, wow. and, and I couldn't read the instructions in this in my owner's manual and I, without my glasses and I thought, boy, this is a really good way of nature ensuring that you die, you know, at age 38 or 39 because if I was in a real environment with the inability to Tell the difference between the toxic plant and the other not and, and non-toxic plant, I would be liable to just jam something in my mouth and eat it and not care whether or not it killed me. So for me, it was just that was a, like the requirement for reading glasses and this uh, crystalline protein aggregation and this hardening of the lens um, almost seemed to me like a slap in the face, like here. Have, here, here's another thing for you to have to deal with. So the heat, and this comes to the heat shock protein kind of question a little bit, the, the ability to deal with cross linkages and stiffening of, uh, you know, proteins and glycination and all of this stuff. So I don't know if I, if I still believe that there's an actual program that's been set up, but I think that there's been some things which I are neglectful and potentially directly uh, bad, like, uh, maybe that, why, that's, it's a very fascinating thing that the CPG islands and that the heat shock protein response is turned off so early and, and that, that does make a difference. And I couldn't think of an evolutionary viable reason for why it should do that. So it is kind of interesting. And I got it, uh, and I'll take off now uh, as well. Robert, yeah, it was I'm a pleasure seeing you and uh, hearing you. Great to see you, Kevin. Say I'm glad the wolves and the tigers didn't get you while you were distracted trying to read all that. <laughs> I know. That's what I would say. It just really, really was a guaranteed uh, uh, exit uh, uh, earlier than you would like. So anyway, everybody have a great eat, great day, great weekend. Thanks a lot. And I'll, I'll leave I'll leave you here yeah. now. Bye for now. Much thanks. Well, anything else? I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording.